When Lynn and I were starting to put this lecture together, one of the first things we had to do was agree to disagree. There's a lot of stuff out there that I think is sort of mythological, but in the terms of practical reality, it doesn't necessarily hold up. The second thing we agreed on was that we wanted you to do, we wanted to provide you with information, new ideas, that you could go away um, thinking differently. Okay? So to that end, I'm going to start by introducing you to some things that have really changed the way I've been thinking in the last few years. And that will tie into sort of creating a, a dynamic, vibrant, resilient body to have vibrant health, healthy breasts, and all that kind of things. Um, so, first thing I came across is this 1491. This is a book about what the Americas were like before the pilgrims showed up, before the European settlers showed up. Um, reports of the Amazon says that as far as you can see upstream, as far as you can see downstream, as far as you can see inland, there were signs of civilization. The reports of what the forest looked like in New England, they said they were so clear of the underbrush you could drive, ride a horse through there. So I would call it permaculture nowadays, but this whole continent was sort of being horticultured by the natives there. So what I mean by horticulture would be like um, they would find a patch of the tubers that they really like to eat, and so they would like dig up a few from the concentrated place, put it, put it, put them where they weren't so many, so that next time that when they came through, there would be a bigger abundance of these tubers, as opposed to, well, I'm going to wipe out everything in this acre in front of me and just plant these tubers. Okay? So. And, there's, there's a civilization that was around the Chicago area, the Pacific Northwest, the uh, California area. There was all these, all this knowledge of how to nurture the land to get more out of it, but not really trying to control and dominate. So there was lots and lots of killing going on, and the Americans had no resistance to the European diseases. So it's by the time that the pilgrims actually showed up, it's estimated that the native population was like five to 10% of what it was a couple hundred years ago. So when they were taking care of the prairie lands, um, when there were millions of buffaloes across the prairie lands, it did not look like that little scrubby, you see on westerns, the scrub lands? It wasn't like that, it was lush and verdant and all these other things, okay. The follow up to this is 1493. 1493 talks about the Columbian Exchange. I wasn't really good at history. I didn't know what the Columbian Exchange was. But that is when, you know, as soon as people started traveling across the desert, as soon as they got in boats and went to distant lands, it's kind of, that's kind of when the globalization happened because they were bringing plants and food sources and diseases here and bringing this back and ultimately changed the landscape. So I used to have in my head that there was some natural, pristine setting that um, people could live in perfect health. And I used to have this idea that there was like one way for people to um, live and eat and have this per perfect health. But I don't think there's any spot on this planet that hasn't been degraded by human influence. Maybe the degradation was hundreds of years ago, but it's, anyway. So, I give up that idea of, of being sort of that. We've had influence everywhere. Um, okay, enough said on that. A book that just came out Last year at the Sustainability Fair, this Joe Robinson, she lives on Vashon Island. Okay. What she has done is 
She's looked at the commercial varieties of foods that we normally eat and has looked at the phytonutrient content of the foods. Um, and tried to help you pick the, uh, the, you know, the best, mo most nutritious species in terms of the phytonutrients. The phytonutrients you've heard about, the polyphenols, the resveratrols, that kind of stuff, those are compounds that the plants make in order to help them withstand stress, but they also have a lot of really great health benefits to us. Now, this is something that we kind of um, did to ourselves you know, years and years and years ago when we, we wanted the biggest, the sweetest, the juiciest of the species. And that's not necessarily the most phytodense uh, of, the, of what we could pick from. Um, for instance, like there are wild apples, like um, they're teeny tiny, they're like the size of the raisin. Five of them would equal the phytonutrients in this honey crisp there. Now it's not about whether it's organic or not organic, it's about the variety. There is, for instance, there's a species of apple that they have found in New Zealand called Monte Surprise. It's got around 400 times the phytonutrient of the regular commercial apple, okay? Now when they look at the effects of the apple extract, they talk about the whole apple. I know you need to eat the skin. I know most of the nutrients in the skin. I'm not sure about the core and all this other part. But they sent this uh, extract of the Monte Surprise apple off to a lab in France. It inhibited colon cancer cells by 80%. You find me a chemotherapeutic drug that does that well on anything, okay? It's an apple, okay? So I've sort of come to think of this more like junk food, okay? Could be better. The heirloom varieties of stuff that are out in people's yards, likely to have more phytonutrients than um, the popular varieties of, of things. And by the way, if you have like a little scrubby, there's fruit trees out there that, in, at least in Pierce County, that no one's paying attention to. There is like this fruit tree steward program. You can you know, turn in a tree and people, volunteers will come up and take care of the fruit trees, split the, split the harvest with the owner of the food bank or whatever, just as a little side note. That being said, someone did do a study on Red Delicious apples and the inhibition of the Red Delicious on rat tumor cells, rat mammary cells, okay? And they rated, I mean, up to six a day is what they rated. So um, looking at food differently these days. So the last thing that I've come across lately is called permaculture. Have you heard of this concept of things, okay? I was at the conference in uh, Te Temecula a couple weekends ago. So you can kind of do naturopathic medicine, kind of like a kinder, gentler version of Western medicine. Use willow bark instead of ibuprofen. And when you think about it, our organic gardening, not all of our organic gardening, but a lot of it is really just a kinder, gentler version of the conventional farming. You're still irrigating and fertilizing and monocropping. And so the new term is kind of sustainable. But if you think that we're teetering on the edge, sustainable means continue to teeter on the edge. And what we need to do is to take a couple steps back from that. So permaculture, it's a design system. It starts with ethics. The three very basics are care of the planet, care of people, fair share of the abundance. And it bothered me at first because you were humans, you know, you weren't, you weren't, uh, you were getting in there and you were designing and you were manipulating, because that's not natural, you're getting in there and playing with things, right? You were designing a system to have a lot of biodiversity, 
which gave it a lot of resiliency, a lot of abundance, and kind of be self-perpetuating. Okay. For example, and, and what's really exciting about this is that you can jump in at any level. If you have a balcony, you can design a system for the balcony. A backyard, you can, there is a, a business in Massachusetts. They have a duplex house on a tenth of an acre. They have 200 species of plants, chickens, a greenhouse, aquaponics, and a nursery business on a tenth of an acre. So that's the kind of biodiversity, bio, um, abundance that a permaculture system can do. You can, all the areas that have, are desert, desertification, turning into deserts in Africa, okay? It looks like kind of scrubby. Our human system says, looks it's kind of scrubby. We need to like keep these animals off. But that land has been used to very high, dense concentrations of animals chomping through it, digging through the soil, pooping, peeing, and then moving on. And that is what rejuvenates those soils, that landscape built into the permaculture is you will build up the soil, you will build up the plant matter. That is a carbon sink. If we get that on enough land, global warming over. Jeff Lawton, J-E-O-F-F, -F, he's down in Australia. He has a lot of like 10 to 15 minute videos to watch. He's kind of famous for greening the desert. Um, in a recent, in a more recent project in the desert, there was, in, in Jordan, there was this plot of land that had just been over-fertilized, over-watered, over-irrigated, and it wasn't fertile anymore. The salts had built up. Conventional wisdom would be get thousands of dollars, thousands of gallons of water, flush out the salt, which isn't going to do anything to help rebuild that soil, and then start all over again. And he just did the basics of what you do with permaculture. So you dig your swales, which changes the way you collect and store and distribute your water, which changes what you can grow there. And the leaves from what you grow there, you let them drop into the soil and that starts making the mulch and you let the little bioorganisms turn that into, into the rich soil and it kind of builds on itself. And a few years later, this is a nice thriving, they're not even really irrigating this place and, and the conventional boys come back and say, well, what happened to the salt? And so they tested the salt, or tested the soil and the salts were still there. It's just that the roots and the, and the bacteria and the mycorrhizae and all the bugs were just doing just fine. We're just handling it just fine. So it's not always about removing the bad. If you have a healthy, dynamic, biodiverse, vibrant system, it can handle some of the bad at a continuing education workshop once upon a time. There was this couple in Colorado. The woman was sick and getting sicker, and no one could figure it out, and no one could figure it out, and no one figured it out, and she was getting sicker. And probably just out of desperation, like, well, we haven't tested for this, they checked her for heavy metals. And her arsenic levels were like through the roof. While they were telling her the findings, they said, you know, and your love, there's no way your levels could be this high unless someone was poisoning you. So we're sending the police to go arrest your husband. And the woman says, I've been with this guy a long time. He does not have the patience for that. If he wanted me dead, he would just shoot me. So they tested his level. He's out, he's walking around, he's fine. His levels were higher than hers. Now, if I'm wanting to create resilient, vibrant health, I kind of want to know what's going on with his system, that he can handle that. I mean, it's nice that they found out what's wrong with her, but how come he can thrive in this? Um, okay. So 
Then I figured out all these years what I've been trying to do is permaculture people's health. It doesn't really help me explain because nobody really knows what that is, but that's what I've been trying to do, okay? Um, so, moving on to creating a, a great system for breast health. Years ago, I don't know why I found this article, but there was a, a UK article that was talking about benign breast pain, uh, fibrocystic breast disease, tender breasts, whatever. The most effective treatment for benign breast pain was to go braless, or bra-free is the term that they're using. It didn't happen overnight. The pain didn't go away overnight when you stopped wearing the bras. Sometimes it took three weeks, six weeks. But if my recollection, I couldn't find it again when I went to go find it. My recollection is it was up to near like 100% effective. Show me anything that's 100% effective for a chronic condition. While I was looking for that article, there was an article that talked about breast pain for women with the back pain, shoulder pain, that they were blaming on, blaming on their big breasts. Same treatment, braless. There again, there's this little, doesn't go away overnight, transition period, but it was highly, highly effective at benign breast pain and the back and shoulder pain. Who knew? Save you some money right there. Um, years ago, there's a book, Bras Cause Cancer, and I think that's the, that's the place where I found, someone was actually measuring the hours a woman spends wearing a bra and her increased risk of breast cancer for that. Um, and you know, people are, were like, well, it's because the breasts are a higher temperature or lymphatic drainage, and I'm like, mm -hmm. There was a study in this chronobiology journal, and um, so chronobiology, they're sort of looking at things that happen in that circadian rhythm, what happens over the course of a day or a week. And they measured the salivary melatonin production when women were not wearing foundational garments. And then they put them in foundational garments, bras and panty, or bras and girdle, for 24 hours, and they measured their melatonin content. Okay. Without the foundational garment, they put out 115 picograms per milligram. In the foundational garment, which they had them in for 24 hours, which but in, the production went down to 51 picograms per milligram, okay. You've all heard about melatonin. We normally think of it as that sleep hormone that comes out of your pineal. It's also a really great antioxidant. And if you go look up melatonin, it does like a billion things. Um, so are we making our systems stronger, weaker, by wearing constrictive clothing? You know, something to think about. Vitamin D, everyone's heard about the importance of vitamin D. We got scared of the sun, the sun is bad. You must slather yourself with the SPF before you go outside. Um, and we, worldwide, we are deficient in vitamin D now. There are people who say if we could have a good level of vitamin D in our bodies, we would prevent 70 to 77% of cancers across the board. Best, I don't know, I guess the most natural way, I don't know, it's around here it's not the most ideal way, is to get sun exposure. And the amount of sun exposure that they recommend is um, half the time it would take you to get pink. So like if you could, stay outside for three hours and get pink at three hours. Hour and a half is about the sun exposure that you need. Okay, so most of the year you go outside, you're turning blue before you turn pink, right? So we're not doing that here. The UVB, the UVB lights, if you wanna to go to the tanning bed, you can check out research what, what's in your area that would be good to help stimulate your vitamin D. There is a vitamin D council that's online and they're gathering a lot of the vitamin D research from over the world. If you wanna get your vitamin D tested through them, you kind of become part of their little research group. They, they had once upon a time 
vitamin D, a vitamin D light, and it wasn't the UVB, it was, I think it was like UVD, and compared, it was only well, like, you know, four or five hundred dollars, which compared to a lot of the home tanning beds is not that bad. Uh, 10, 15 minutes of exposure would get you your vitamin D for the day. And I emailed them and I asked them, well, will you tan if with this? And the response back was, well, not if you use it as directed. So most of us are probably going to be taking it orally, right? Okay. There are some people who are not able to absorb the vitamin D from their gut. So you can do it sublingually. So because of that, I always think it's a good reason kind of to test and measure. Where's your vitamin D level at? When they looked at women uh, with breast cancer and their vitamin D levels, a lower vitamin D level was associated with bigger tumors, more aggressive, higher vitamin D levels, smaller tumor, less aggressive. They didn't report a vitamin D level with no cancers ever. So, okay, it's part of a bigger picture. You want to be taking, it's D3 you want. You want to be taking it with the K2, the vitamin K2 to keep the calcium out of your blood vessels. Um, when you're making, Vitamin D from sunshine, it starts out as the cholesterol molecule, okay? So maybe part of why we're vitamin D deficient, and we've also had this war on the cholesterol, made cholesterol bad. We don't have enough for it to make all our hormones and do all the other things that cholesterol does. Someone who did the study on vitamin D in cancer cells the mechanism and why it's beneficial in cancer cells is there's something, the vitamin D causes a molecule in the epithelial cells. Epithelial is like skin cells and a lot of your breast tissue came from the same embryological tissue as the epithelial cells. Is, um, so vitamin D helps these cells make a protein that stick the cells together, keep, keep the cell, cells together. With, that, with less vitamin D, they're more likely to break apart and move around. So that could be increasing like the metastases in the breast cancer. You don't have enough vitamin D to keep your cells together. Okay. So I'm just thinking out loud at this. I'm not saying there's any other research out there that agrees with me, but we, what happens to our overall immune system if we are vaccinating everybody against routine diseases, okay? We kind of know that a lot of these vaccines are not lifetime immunity, whereas getting the disease would be. There are outbreaks of measles in colleges now and again that happen in previously vaccinated populations. Now, when you vaccinate, I kind of look at getting sick as like a uh, workout for your immune system. It's training grounds for your immune system. You get the vaccine, you don't really get this huge response. So I'm wondering if all this vaccination is kind of making our immune systems just kind of weak and lazy and they don't go out on patrol and recognize these, these um, infected cells, these cancerous cells. I don't know, I'm just thinking. One of my favorite things to use is iodine. Um, Optimox, O-P-T-I-M-O-X, would be a good source. They have a lot of vitamin or iodine research. Um, pretty much everything I can tell you, someone's gonna tell you that I'm absolutely crazy. This is something that is definitely outside the box for a lot of people. And whenever I go outside the box, I'm usually, I'm gonna play with it on myself for a bit. I'm gonna ease into it gently, working with clients. So if I'm up here telling you I'm doing this, it's because I've seen good effects and very, very little bad, okay? Even though it's really outside the box. Um, we think of iodine mainly in the terms of your thyroid, right? The thyroid needs iodine, okay? If you have, when they talk about the thyroid hormones, they talk about T3, T4, 
Three means there's three molecules of iodine. Four means there's four molecules of iodine on that hormone. The breast concentrates iodine to a greater extent than the thyroid. Iodine receptors are all over the body. There's cells, certain cells have a special pump to pump iodine in. Um, cervical cells, prostate, uh, what else do I have here? The choroid plexus, which is the thing, the apparatus that makes the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, these are all places where iodine gets concentrated, so it's really more important to all tissues of the cell than just the thyroid gland. So, when you look at the risk factor for cancer, there's certain things that are like good for everything, like exercise and normal body weight. But there's a couple things that are specific for decreasing your risk of breast cancer. And one of them is like having a full-term pregnancy before the age 30. So what happens during pregnancy is the breasts get even better at collecting the iodine because um, there's a mental retardation that can happen when a baby is gestated or grown with low iodine. It's called cretinism, so it's very important for the baby to get a lot of iodine. And I'm wondering if, if we just saturated our tissues with iodine, if that is what is the equivalent to the protective effect on the pregnancy before age 30. I don't know. Um, iodine is an antioxidant. It will break down the hydrogen peroxide. It is a little bit lipid soluble, fat soluble, so you can use it with, with niacin to uh, start eliminating the plaques in your arteries. Uh, think of protection of your brain, antioxidant protection of your brain, since your brain is mainly fat. Iodine induces apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, okay? Sometimes, well, like when the baby is growing, you want these, and it's making fingers, you want the cells to die between the fingers, so you have fingers. The other way um, we use that apoptosis is if there is an infected cell or if there is a damaged cell, we want to get in there and be able to destroy it and kill it off, apoptosis. That's a term you hear a lot in when you're, when you're looking at cancer. You want the apoptosis, meaning you want those cells to die. It is antimicrobial across a big, long spectrum. You can go out, get some swamp water, put some iodine in it, let it sit for a while, and that'll kill off all the microorganisms. Probably won't taste that great, but you won't have any infected things going on. You can use iodine in pregnant women. It is that safe. One of the things it'll do is thin mucus. Whatever iodine we do get is competing with the chlor our chlorinated water. I don't know if you have fluoridated water down here, but we have fluoridated water down in Tacoma. And bromide, bromide is <laughs> Wikipedia, bromide, poison. Um, but it's also used in citrus flavored um, beverages, okay? Um, years ago, they used to use iodine as a, in processing the flour. So in your, do, in your slice of bread, you got a nice dose of iodine. Then they switched over to brominating. Back then, the risk of breast cancer was 1 in 20. Now we've got a risk of breast cancer in 1 in 8. Okay. So if you're taking iodine, that is going to help your body detoxify from the chlorine, detoxify from the, the fluoride, detoxify from the bromide. I did not go back to the original um, research, but they were also talking about iodine being helping you to detoxify from mercury, cadmium, and lead. You mean like if you were, if you had to take radio radioactive iodine for scans and stuff like that? You know, the last, I didn't, I heard of cesium 
levels that they're testing from that plant, and I don't know if there's different types of radiation from different plants, um, but, but I don't know that it would help if it's a cesium that they're sending out. It's not what? It's not in the research that I did, and even if it is radioactive iodine that's out there, you would have to have your tissues saturated with the iodine already so that your body's not that interested in the radioactive iodine. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So there are some people who say you cannot have a thyroid, a thyroid problem without having low iodine, okay? And there's some people who associate hypothyroid with an increased risk in breast cancer, so it may be the iodine connection there. Um, it also, iodine will also help normalize your cortical steroid hormone production. You're under stress, but not a lot of the cortical steroids, iodine is gonna help calm that down. You wanna take it with selenium, okay? So this is because if you push, if you're taking iodine, it's gonna be pushing this pathway and it also interacts with this pathway, which is making glutathione, which is another one of your body's antioxidant systems, very powerful antioxidant systems. So you're pushing it with a, by giving it extra iodine. And selenium over here, it's a nutrient we're also commonly deficient in. If we run out of that, we're gonna get kind of backups in that system and mess things up. So if you take it with selenium, you're not likely to run up against those um, problems. It also, breaks down the estrone, which is considered the, I don't know, more dangerous, more pro-cancer hormone into the estriol, which is, um, you know, the less dangerous, less cancer-promoting type of, of estrogen. All right. Someone want to help me out? Tell me how much, um, this is kelp. Tell me how much iodine is in a tablet of kelp. There's no iodine or iodide, nothing in that kelp there? Really? Oh, it's just, I said, sorry. Kelp, it says kelp with folic acid and there's no iodine. Okay. I don't, yeah, there's some times when it's just like, it's not a huge difference. I, I would shoot for 200 um, micrograms of selenium a day, and I'm not too picky about the type. Um, okay, so some people, they want to do things in the most natural way, and so why not use kelp? Well, the doses, I should have looked at the bottle. I just had to go grab some. But usually it's, um, in a kelp tablet, it's going to be in the um, microgram dosage. I recommend you do like 37 and a half milligrams, okay? So you might go through two or three bottles of kelp to get to that level, right? So, the inorganic iodine is the stuff that I recommend, and if you can find stuff with selenium in it, great. Um, there are people who will use 50 to 100 milligram levels to treat, fight breast cancer, okay? But I really like iodine. It just does, you know, if you have cold hands, hands and feet, some people, it helps warm them up. Two, three hundred years ago, they just used tincture of iodine to do, be this overall wellness uh, compound. Some products of it are just really reasonably priced. Okay. Good bacteria. Yes. This is iodine. This is an iodine, and uh, each of the tablets is uh, like 12.5 milligrams. Okay. I just had her run downstairs and get a bottle of something that I could show you. Elemental iodine, 
around the 37.5 milligrams. And if you take it with, um, with selenium, most people aren't gonna have any problems unless you're bromide toxic and you give the iodine and it starts moving the bromide around and that makes you feel bad. Okay. So, fermenting foods. Two teaspoons of sea salt, a quart of water. You may have to warm up the water to get all the salt dissolved. Leave it in a warm place for four to seven days. That's as fussy as it needs to be, okay? Um, and the last year I had some green tomatoes left over and after trying a bunch of stuff with it, one of my books had a recipe for fermented green tomatoes. And you know, most of the time they make it sound really fussy. You need a special crock and you need the culture or the whey and all this other fancy stuff. And so I just never got into it. And plus, all due respect to cabbage, I don't really care for it. You ferment and it gets this kind of squishy and I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat it. So made these uh, fermented green tomatoes and that was okay. And so my next adventure, I found fermenting for dummies at the library. And so I think my first batch was carrots and daikon and um, turnips. Simple, simple. Um, to keep it, there's, there's no place in my house at 70 degrees, seven days straight in the winter time. So I had those, a seed mat. And I, so I put my, the jar in the seed mat, covered up with the blanket and left it there. And so I ate some. This is kind of crunchy salty. Um, I am a hedonist and a glutton before I'm a health nut. So I just kind of sat there. I, I gave some to a friend of mine and she was like, it's good. And I gave some to another friend who does the fermenting and they're like, it's good. And I'm like, what? And you know, fermenting's the way of preserving food. So it was sitting there and it wasn't even refrigerated and it wasn't going bad and it wasn't going bad and it wasn't going bad. So I decided maybe I better start eating it. Uh -huh. Couple tablespoons in the morning. Just salty, crunchy. Um, but after a few days, and I, I couldn't tell you that things were bothering me, but after a few days it was like, oh, my tummy feels better. And I could see it was doing some things. And I thought, well, it's that easy and that cheap and works really well. Maybe I'd better be doing a little bit more of this. Because over, we have all, for years and years now, we have heard how good it is for our digestive tract, right? And I have had brands of expensive probiotics on my shelf through the years, and I've taken them, and a lot of the time, I can't tell the difference. So it's like, if I can be that simple, that effective, it's gonna be worth, worth my time. Two tablespoons of sea salt, quart of water, keep it warm for four to seven days. I've tried jicama, pineapple, um, you know, beets. There's a lot of variety. Now, the garlic, if you put the garlic in there, it gets a little strong, you may not wanna do that, but. Back to the little bit, back to the permaculture, that they have found four types of bacteria that will take a pesticide, a certain pesticide residue in the soil and then eat it for breakfast, right? This biodiversity is really cool about cleaning up the environment and doing what we need for it. All right. So, most of your immune system is right around your gut, right? The gut-associated lymphatic tissue. So what seems to happen is that these good bacteria, these probiotics, it's like they train your immune system to go out and fight the good fight at non-local areas, okay? I ran across an article where taking probiotics uh, helped the health of the seminiferous tubules and then produced the testosterone production. There are studies, there again, and this is with rats who are sort of been designed, programmed to have mammary tumors. 
lactobacillus reduces the number of tumors, the size of the tumors, and the pro prolongs the dur duration for the tumors to come about, okay? Who knew? Who knew that some, the bugs for your gut help your immune system in distant locations? So there again, worth trying. Um, there are actually a lot of the water systems these days are using plants and bacteria and fungi to clean up the water system, which is like, you know, very cool, and bugs and bacteria work for cheap. Um, okay, so going back to risk factors for cancer, risk factors for breast cancer, um, we, you know, we know we need to do things like make sure our blood sugar is normalized, and we want to make sure we don't have any occult inflammation. They have found that there's an inflammatory pathway that coincides with what the, breast can what the cells need to do to become cancer cells, okay? Um, the other risk factor that seems to be specific for breast cancer is alcohol consumption. Across the boards, across the boards, people who drink some are better off than the people who drink too much and the people who don't, don't drink any, okay? But in, in terms of breast cancer, any amount of alcohol increases that risk. So trying to have the best of both worlds. A new, a new trend, have you heard of like the methylation defects and the methyl tetrahydrofolate and that kind of stuff? Okay, some of us, and it's getting pretty cheap to test your genetics, like 23andMe, you can get your genetics uh, tested and some of us have genes that work really well and efficiently, some of us don't and some of us don't methylate well, some of us uh, can't take this molecule and turn it into a more effective molecule for our body to use. So when you're consuming alcohol, you're gonna use up more of your B12, your folate, um, your vitamin A, your calcium. So maybe we need to take more folate, more of the active form of the folate, more of the, act, the active forms of the B vitamins, and that can mitigate our risk with the alcohol so we can have a little fun every now and then. That's what we like to do. Vitamin A. Some people don't, most of the time in a bottle of multivitamins or something like that, that, has, that says it has vitamin A in it, it's not really going to have vitamin A in it because too much vitamin A, it can be toxic for adult, but it's reversible toxicity. But for a fetus, a growing fetus, it can be teratogenic. Okay, so safety-wise, you're probably not going to find a huge amount of, or, you're gonna find beta carotene in nutritional products, and it's gonna be listed as vitamin A equivalents because some of us can take the beta carotene and turn it into vitamin A. Some of us can't. So making sure you're getting like real vitamin A in your diet might be another way to mitigate the effects of alcohol. And calcium, calcium's a mess. I don't wanna talk about calcium, calcium, but just no, okay. So, yeah? No, no, I didn't, no. That, we could talk three or four hours on calcium. I don't want to tell you, it's just too big of a, it's another big issue, okay? All right, so if I'm trying to build resilience, um, vibrant, healthy bodies, and I look at what we're doing, tight clothing to reduce our melatonin, low intake of iodine, we're not getting enough uh, of uh, vitamin D because we're afraid of the sun and we want sterile food so we don't want the good bacteria around. We've got these untrained immune systems and the foods that we are eating are phytonutrient deficient compared to what they could be. Oh, these are garlic chives. These, um, when she talks about onions, sweet onions, low in phytonutrients, you're gonna be better off eating the green onions or the shallots. And these are, the, these are garlic chives. They're not the little sprouts that come out of the garlic. They're their own little set of things. Pretty easy to grow. 
I was going to pass it around and let you guys nibble if you want. Does that sound? Yes? OK. If I can grow it, I, I need to figure out how to manage it. I can grow it, you can probably grow it, but it would be a great way, throw a little garnish in your salad, whatever, add a little phytonutrients into your, um, to whatever you're eating. So, there's been a lot of controversy over the mammograms lately, right? Okay. Depending upon who you're gonna be listening to, You know, the review articles, so depending upon who you listen to, there are some people who are saying that mammograms aren't any better at detecting tumors than a good pair of hands. There are people who are saying that 2,000 women would need to be screened for 10 years in order to prevent one death. So they're not really even preventing that many deaths. In the meantime, you're gonna have 10 women have biopsies and follow-ups and all this other kinds of stuff that didn't need to be messed with, okay? Um, there again, I'm not telling you what to do, what not to do, you make your own decisions, just passing on some information. One of the, okay, the cancer, an inconvenient truth. That's, um, there's a little bit more to the title, but I think if you Googled cancer and inconvenient truth, you could get to this article. For something that's published in a medical journal, it is really easy to read. They go back a little bit over the, um, the history of breast cancer treatment. Kind of like we had a war on poverty and we had a war on drugs, a while ago we had this war on cancer and everybody's gonna get screened and everybody's gonna get treated like we tend to do. I mean, good science says we leave a control group, but the ethics say if we think it's gonna be really good, we need everybody, we're gonna put everybody in this group. So what they didn't know was that there were things like inconsequential tumors, innocuous cancers stuff that you could leave alone, and it was never gonna cause any problems, okay? Maybe cancers that come and go. Within this research, oftentimes they'll, they'll find what they call carcinoma in situ, which means it's a group of cancer cells in situ in place, it's not metastasized, it's not, um, it's just there. So what is likely happening in that kind of situation, either the cancer cells are kind of dormant or the surrounding tissue, the host tissue, if you will, has got things balanced in that um, the growth factors that might be there in that tumor cell are inhibited by the apoptosis and all the other things that are going around in that tissue, okay? We don't have a way of figuring out what's going on there. Like, if you look at that cancer cell, yeah, it's a cancer cell, but, it, but since it's in, but we don't, know what the, we don't have a way of telling what that tissue surrounding it, is that going to keep it in check and it's not ever going to become an issue or is this going to become a problem later on down the line? We don't have a way of detecting that. So in this cancer and in, in an inconvenient truth, what they have said, a couple different things, but when you go in, surgically remove the tumor, when you create a wound, in the normal healing, your body needs to send out growth factors to grow blood vessels to heal that tissue. Okay. Those same compounds can be used by a cancer cell to grow blood vessels and set up shop somewhere. Now, when I was in school, they said remove the tumor and then just support the immune system. But maybe in the removing the tumor, you're stimulating the growth of a different tumor at a different spot. Does that make sense? 
okay? Um, another couple other articles that I ran across. And um, I went to either like Google Canada or Google Australia because I wanted to find out bad stuff about cancer treatment. I wasn't finding it on our Google, okay? So there was an Australian article, it was a review article, and they looked at the five-year, the effect of chemotherapy on the five-year survival rate. Not the five-year disease-free disease rate, not if it improved the quality of life, just the five-year survival rate. And across the boards, for some cancers it's better, for some cancers it's worse, but across the board, uh, and it was like 2.3 for Australia and 2.1% for US. Um, chemotherapy only added like 2% to the five-year survival. For breast cancer, is only 1.6%. Now, if you buy lottery tickets, you might like a 1.6% odds. For me, I don't know that that would be enough for me to make it worth it. And that's for your... That's your decision. Some people are like, I don't care what it does. If, it, if I live one more week, that's great. Some people would say, no, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna take the risk for the benefits that it's there. Whatever you wanna do. Another looked at the effect of radiation on breast cancer cells. And yes, you will kill off a bunch of the cancer cells, but the ones that survive, you piss them off and they come back more aggressive. Okay. So I say this a little bit tongue-in-cheek right now, but it's almost become my working theory that if you survive breast cancer, you are going to do it anyway. I don't know, okay? Um, I haven't had a mammogram. I don't intend to have a mammogram. A lot of my very health-conscious patients do have mammograms. I'm. There's a lot of times I keep my mouth shut if they think they're doing the right thing. I don't know. I don't know why they do them. But